Do you ever have the feeling that life is speeding up? I'm not just talking about having more work to do. The scientists who study big global processes talk about something called the Great Acceleration. Since the middle of the last century, we've seen a five-fold increase in the urban population, a ten-fold increase in economic output. At the same time, we've seen massive decreases in poverty. But that comes as well with substantial growing inequality. It comes with significant risks. The Great Acceleration also describes a range of very terrifying trends. They have to do with the expansion of deforestation, for example, of soil degradation, loss in biodiversity, and greenhouse gas emissions. So, for many people in the world today who are living in environments that depend directly on the natural resource base for livelihoods and for food, this is not some hypothetical future. The risks that we're talking about are risks that people live every day. And it may seem that if you have the financial ability to travel, to choose where you want to live, to import your food, that you can distance yourself from these sorts of risks. That you can distance yourself from those who are living on the edge. But nature has a way of catching up. We saw that very dramatically quite recently in terms of the massive storms that came through the Caribbean, that hit Texas and Florida. In the wealthiest country on this planet, today we have environmental refugees. So, these are problems that affect all of us, wherever we live, whatever sorts of resources we have. And the question is, where do we go from here? Are we headed towards a future that looks something like the movie Mad Max? Is it a future in which we'll see more and more brutal struggles for survival? Or will we find a way to adapt collectively? Will we find a way to shift our economies, our social systems, so that we take better care of our environment and create a better future for all? I like to think of it as a fork in the road. Are we headed towards conflict or cooperation? This is the kind of thing that societies confront repeatedly. And if we think about it, what created the crises that we're living through now is a whole accumulation of human choices. So, at this fork in the road, if people and the choices that we have made got us into these problems, then it's people and the choices we will make that can decide whether we'll get out. So as a social scientist, I ask, what is it that changes people's behavior? And I like to boil it down, to keep it simple, to say there are three big things. The first is coercion. Okay, that's about laws, rules, limits, and what happens, what are the consequences when you don't follow those rules. Say, take for example, a company where we say you're not allowed to emit certain chemicals into the environment, into the air, or into the water. If you break those rules, there can be fines, you can be shut down. 
if you're the head of a company and you do it knowingly, you can be put in jail. But some forms of coercion are pretty small. Little nudges. Things like you go to the store and you take your reusable bags, maybe you get a little discount. Or you buy an electric car, maybe you get a tax break. The biggest environmental policy success on a global level that we've seen in the last couple of decades is about the reduction in ozone depleting emissions. Coercion works. It is the main tool of public policy to say we set rules, we set limits for the public good. The second big factor in influencing people's behaviors to change is conviction. This one is about belief. How many vegetarians do we have in the audience today? Several. For some people, the choice to be a vegetarian or to eat less meat is an acknowledgement of the environmental footprint that we make as individuals. And in fact, the food that you eat, your choices about what to eat, are one of the most important ways in which you can shrink or increase your own environmental footprint. Other people might make a similar choice, but for reasons of faith or for health. Whatever it is, though, that's a matter of individual belief or conviction. Why do you think it is that in Paris, 195 governments were able to come together and reach an agreement to reduce greenhouse gas emissions? Was it because there was new scientific evidence? A little bit. But there had been strong evidence already for many years. The biggest change was that around the globe, people became more strongly aware of the risks of climate change and propelled their governments to do something about it, to reach an agreement together. So these two elements, coercion and conviction, can actually work together. If people feel strongly enough, they can make or influence others to change, even at a big scale, companies and governments, and decisions between governments. So for some people, they say, well, that's about it. That's the end of the story. For me, there's another important way to shift behavior that doesn't require everyone to agree and yet can still lead to big changes. And that's collaboration. And so what that means, you might think, well, it's just when people already agree and they decide to work together. But I'm talking about something rather specific here. In this context of environmental change and risk, the kind of collaboration that we need is the kind that recognizes people's differences, and nevertheless enables us to be able to work together to solve big problems, even when we can't necessarily agree on many things. So how does this work? Let me give a couple of examples. About eight years ago, I started working with a group in Cambodia called the Coalition for Cambodian Fishers. It's a civil society network. And this is a place where people depend upon fishery resources as a key part of livelihood. For many people, often the poorest, it's the most important way to make a living and to get food for their family. So when people had been working for years in these communities to petition the government to say, 
Can we have more fishing grounds? Can we have access to these other areas that are given instead for commercial use? They hadn't reached success. What we did was we worked through a dialogue process that said, okay, let's bring together, first at the local level, all the key groups involved. Fishers, of course, but also the police, the local government, the environment officers, the military police. And let's try to understand together what are the roots of the problem and how can we address those? What are the possible actions that can help to improve the situation? And one of the things that came out of this dialogue process was that local groups found new routes to influence policymakers at the national level and in the parliament. And as a result, they were able to secure the first release in a decade of one of these commercial fishery areas to community management. And it caught on. So that in the following year, based on the success, the whole collection of organizations and civil society groups around this huge Don Le Sap, the Great Lake in Cambodia, became a social movement pressing for this kind of change. And indeed, not long after, the government made a huge shift, the largest shift in freshwater fishery access in all of Asia, from commercial to community management. And that has meant a big improvement for hundreds of thousands of people who depend on that resource. The community that was at the center of this has also become a pioneer in helping to protect the resource, working jointly with local authorities. Another example is from the western part of India, Gujarat state. And this is an area that has suffered from a great deal of deforestation and decreases in soil fertility. It's an area where you've got people who are living on the edge because it's becoming more and more difficult to make a good living from farming. There's a wonderful group called the Foundation for Ecological Security that works in Gujarat. And what they've done is they've worked, again, with local communities, with all of the key actors involved, and found ways to rehabilitate these degraded lands. So what you see here is a picture before and after this key effort, community-based effort, to say, we'll take responsibility for these resources if we can have some certainty that we'll be able to reap the benefits. This group has now extended the approach working in 7,000 villages in India, in eight states, to promote common property management of land and water and forests as a way of recovering not only the environment, but also local livelihoods. It's helping to reduce poverty and reduce the vulnerability that families face when confronting environmental change. So, these couple examples point to the fact that a collaborative process can yield results, but it doesn't happen by accident. The approach that I've been working with is something I call collaborating for resilience. And this means working through a stepwise process with all of the key actors involved around a compelling central purpose to try to see what can we understand together about the roots of conflict or conflict risk in the future? What can we do to explore the different roots, the different actions to address those and the consequences that might come out? And finally, 
what kind of choices can we make, either as individuals or as groups aligned together, to be able to really affect significant change. So the beauty of this and the power of it is that it's quite distinct from a requirement that we reach full consensus, that everybody is heading in the same direction. Oftentimes, that's just too difficult. Instead, if we look to understand jointly the roots of conflict over environmental resources, then we can better find pathways out together. It's with an acknowledgement and understanding of that collective problem that we can reach collective action. Not all in the same direction, but working together in groups with a common understanding overall of what the problems are that we need to face. And that can be enough. That can be enough to influence big changes. So, this great acceleration that we're living in the middle of, nobody can say for sure where it's headed next. Some, like Elon Musk, the head of Tesla and SpaceX, have said the, the risks are so great that we're undermining our ability to sustain life on Earth, that we really ought to have a plan B. We ought to look at colonizing space. That's a pretty grim future. That means the only ones who survive are the Earth's environmental refugees. Personally, I'd rather commit my effort to working on solutions that provide a decent future for all on this little planet that we share together. And what that requires is not just scientific innovation, though that's really important. It also requires innovation in our social and economic systems. It requires institutional innovation. And this, at its core, means that we have to get better as individuals, as communities, as societies, as countries, as a global community, at the art and the science of collaboration. 